in Matthew chapter 22, when the people came to uh, Jesus and presented him with a coin and asked him whose image was on it, remember that? And he said, Caesar's image. And that's where he said, render therefore to Caesar that which belongs to Caesar, or to God that which belongs to God, okay? Uh, also, you remember the story where Peter uh, said, Lord, someone has asked us about paying taxes, and Jesus said, go down and catch a fish, and so he did. And there was a coin in the fish's mouth. And that word translated there is the Hebrew, word, Hebrew uh, the English, I'm sorry, the Greek word, stater. And it refers to a stater or to a certain coin of the time, something that was minted and used specifically for a purchasing item. So in the parable of talents, remember that? Uh, the man gave five talents to one man, three to one, and then one to one. And the talent does not refer to the ability to play a musical instrument, to sing, or something like that. But the talent referred to a, a measurement of silver or a measurement of gold. So in that parable of the talents, the Lord came back and he referred to the money that he had given each servant. And the Greek word used there is argurion, which can be translated silver. It can be translated a shekel. It can also be translated drachma which was a figure of money for that particular day. So, Paul warned Timothy in 1 Timothy 6.10. A lot of people misquote this in the Bible. You ever heard anybody say this? Well, money is the root of all evil. You ever heard that? Sure you have. Uh, actually, in 1 Timothy, Timothy 6.10, uh, Paul says this, the love of money is the root of all evil. Money is only, it can't do anything evil. It is just simply an exchange. It is a tangible object. So money can be used for evil. You can actually earn money by doing evil, things like that. But actually money itself is just a medium. It's, it's, uh, it's actually uh, has no capacity to do right or wrong on its own. Uh, money can take many forms. But the form of the money is not as important as developing the skill of managing whatever money one has. So, we've been talking about money, and this whole message this morning is going to be about the Bible and your budget. Over the years, I have had, I don't know if you want to call it the privilege or the opportunity, sometimes the disappointment, I've had of counseling sessions with couples who told me this. They came in, and they said, we have financial problems in our marriage, there isn't enough money to meet our needs. We don't know why we should have to tithe. We don't know why we should have to give to mission and so forth and so on. Well, as the session continued and I began to ask specific questions, I found that their income in almost all cases was somewhere between three and four times more than mine was. So our time uh, is, is or going to be used in order to make money or our time is going to be used in order to... Um, to use money for meeting personal needs and things like that. And when I was in these counseling sessions, I did my best to show these people that the real problem was not how much money they had or didn't have, but it was how they managed the personal resources they had at that time. They, they all had more money than I did. So their situation was the same as many others that I've counseled, uh, counseled over the years. Here are some of the things that characterized this particular couple, heavy credit card debt, uh, lack of restraint in buying, and obsession with things that cost money just because they wanted to use them to have fun or something like that. In addition, whenever I counseled these people and they were church members professing to be Christians, they did not tithe, they did not give to missions, and their church attendance was weak. They were here sometimes, but not all the time. Now, I want to give you some biblical principles that will help you budget your money in a way that will do the following. Number one, it will keep you out of debt. Number two, it will help your credit rating. And number three, it will meet your legitimate needs. And I emphasize legitimate because a lot of people have a tendency to want something and call it a need. I heard a girl say the other day, I need a cell phone. <laughs> I don't think that's a need. Uh, uh, food is. <laughs> uh, and 
And then this also, this number four, it will help you honor the Lord. So it will keep you out of debt, help you build a credit rating, meet your legitimate needs, and it will honor the Lord. So let me give you a brief outline that I think will go along with budget. Most of you probably already do this. Number one, put God first. Put God first. When Gene and I were dating at Tennessee Temple years ago, we exchanged what our life's verses were, and she told me hers was Matthew 6.33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And I think she would testify. There have been times when we were wondering where the next meal was coming from, or we knew what the next meal was, and that wasn't very encouraging. And, uh, but at the same time, God met the need. And uh, she would tell you, I'm sure, that uh, God has always met our need. You see, the priority of the kingdom of God brings other priorities into a person's life. Just as soon as you say, I'm going to put the kingdom of God first in my life, immediately other priorities begin to develop. They begin to push other things out of the way. Uh, one such is uh, your attitude towards money. If you're seeking first the kingdom of God, your attitude toward money is going to be totally different from someone who isn't. I can guarantee you that. Um, there was a passage that was embraced by the people of Israel, and this one we just read, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, where have we robbed thee? God says in tithes and offerings. So under the law, tithing was mandated. Malachi 3.10 says, Bring you all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. That's putting God's kingdom first. You, you remember one place in the Old Testament uh, when, the, when the prophets were pointing out the fact that most of the people were doing really, uh, doing really well at keeping their own houses up but the house of God was falling apart. <laughs> and that, the, that was looked at as a reflection of their attitude toward the Lord. So he said, bring you all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house and prove me now with here with, saith the Lord. So when one puts God first, God does promise special blessings on those who put him first. Uh, and here are some of the blessings. First of all, sharing in the care of God's house. Uh, every time I sign the uh, tithing check, I'm honored to have a part in caring for God's house. <coughs> Are you? And that's what God's concerned about. What about showering a blessing upon us that there isn't room enough to receive it? I'll have to say that since Gene and I have been married, our lives have been showered with uh, blessings. Blessings that haven't been room enough to receive. And then there's a third thing here. I mentioned, first of all, is putting God first, we share in the care of God's house. We are showered with blessings that we don't have room enough to receive. And thirdly, God strips away threats to our existing resources. In verse 11, he says, uh, and I will rebuke the devourer. And what he's talking about, the text clearly says so. What he's talking about, that is the insects that will come and destroy the crops so that they would not produce what they were supposed to produce. But the concept is not only enemies of the crops, but in our present day, enemies of our resources. Somebody asked me one time, said, do you believe that God is concerned about the condition of your car? Sure I do. Do you believe that God is concerned about the condition of your washing machine? Sure I do. Yeah, I believe God's concerned about all of those. And I believe I can honestly say, I can't prove it scientifically, but I believe I can honestly say there have been times when something that we used on a regular basis continued longer than we expected it to because God maybe oversaw that, you know. Um, so when you make up your budget as a believer, put first giving to the Lord. So we're talking here about your budget, and the first thing we said is put God first. Uh, that, and the reason I put that number one in the outline is because everything else is going to depend on that. Number two, number two, this is the toughy part, okay. Put self on the cross. Put self on the cross. <coughs> Greed, covetousness, profligacy, these are all manifestations of the old nature. And the old man, the selfish flesh, the part of you that's remained from what your life was before you met Christ, wants what he wants when he wants it, and he will walk over anything or anybody to get his way. In Exodus chapter 18, when Moses' father-in-law said, you need help in overseeing the people of Israel, 
And we need to follow God's guidelines here. So here are the kind of men that you need to select in order to oversee the management of the nation of Israel. He said they have to be able men such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness. Is that interesting? Hating covetousness. You see, covetous Christians don't tithe. You know why? Because they desire for themselves the tithes and offerings that already rightfully belong to God. Now, they'd never admit that, of course. They'd never tell you that. But that's basically what's operating there. Um, there are only two sources of information for running our lives. One is the Word of God, and the other is everything else. And you have to decide which you're going to do. So those people obviously don't realize that when you steal from God, he says right here, it comes with a curse. Now this is not the kind of curse you get from the uh, wicked witch of the East and the, you know, the Wizard of Oz or something like this. What the kind of curse this is, is God's judgment or condemnation as a result of disobedience. That's what he's talking about. So he says in verse 9, you're cursed with a curse for you've robbed me. God told the people. So how are we going to put ourselves on the cross? How are we going to put the self on the cross so that it doesn't, you know, rob from God, steal from God? The self doesn't want to go to the cross. The self doesn't want to give up the tithe. The person, I've always found years ago in all my years of experience that whenever a person wants to argue about whether to tithe on the gross or um, after the, the taxes have come out, the net, uh, that person probably is not going to tithe anyway. Because most people who are tithers are going to be looking for ways to give more, not give less. So how do we put this old man, this self that remains in us, that's covetous and wants to rob God, how do we put him on the cross? Well, first thing we do is we recognize that the power for us to do so is already available. The reason I say that is because when the Bible tells us that we're supposed to do something, we're already enabled to do it or the command wouldn't be there. So he says in Romans 6.6, 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that is Jesus Christ, that henceforth we should not serve sin. We're alive in him. The old man is dead. We no longer have to serve sin. So the first thing we have to do is we're going to put ourselves on the cross so that covetousness does not cause us to rob God. Then we've got to recognize the power to do so is already available. Then we have to recognize the second thing. We have to recognize that it is our decision to act on that fact. When Jesus died on the cross, a lot of people actually believe this. I come in contact, and it seems to be more and more prevalent than ever in my Christian life. Uh, a lot of people actually believe that just because Jesus went to the cross and died and paid for their sins, they're going to heaven. Uh, almost everybody believes that everybody's going to heaven <laughs> because Jesus died on the cross. That's not what the Bible teaches, of course. The Bible teaches that Jesus paid for the sins of all men. But in order for a person to be sure he's going to heaven, he has to admit he's a sinner, repent of that, and he has to invite Christ to be his personal Savior. And then there is a personal application of the blood of Christ to the person's life so that when he dies, he spends eternity with Christ. People don't automatically go to heaven. But a lot of people believe that. A lot of religions are now teaching that. All you have to do is believe in God and everything's okay. You know, uh, and it's, a, it's, it's a growing heresy. It keeps growing. So the first thing we have to do is recognize the power to uh, put the old man on the cross is already available. The second thing is we have to recognize that it's our decision to do so. Just like the decision to be saved is a personal act, so is the decision to nail the old man to the cross. Romans 6.11, Paul says, this is the command too. He says, Reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then later he says, I die daily, which tells us that putting the old man on the cross is a daily responsibility and it has, to, it has to be acted on frequently. You can't just do it one time and it's all over. But then there's a third thing, recognize the power of God's word to overcome covetousness. Recognize the power of God's word to overcome covetousness. 
And almost every time I've counseled with people who are going through a difficult time, and uh, to what they're talking about is a difficult time, doesn't really seem like that to me. But when I get to counseling with them, what I find out is they don't spend any time in the Word of God. Well, the Word of God is what builds you up. It'd be, it, it, it's the, the same spiritually, going without the Bible spiritually, is the same as refusing to eat physically. You eventually die. <laughs> you know, and, and you don't lose your salvation if you've been saved, but you can dry up and wither spiritually. So you recognize the power of God's Word to overcome covetousness. Psalm 119.36, the writer says, Incline mine heart unto thy testimonies, meaning the Word of God, and not to covetousness. So if you want to stop being covetous, you need to spend more time in the Word of God. If you want to stop being lustful, spend more time in the Word of God. If you want to, spend more, if you want to stop being angry, spend more time in the Word of God. Whatever problem you're facing, the solution is always the Word of God. That's always the solution. So number four, recognize that contentment with God's provision Recognize that contentment with God's provision helps prevent covetousness. Now, before I develop that, let me go back and review it. We're talking now. We're under put self on the cross. That's number two in your outline. And then we ask the question, how do I put to the cross this self that wants to steal from God, wants to love everything except the Lord? The first thing is recognize the power to do so is already available. Our old man had been crucified already. And secondly, recognize that it is our decision to act on that fact. Paul said, I die daily. He said, reckon yourselves dead. It's a, it's a word that indicates calculate. It's a, an intellectual decision. And then thirdly, he says, recognize the power of God's word to overcome covetousness. You can't keep reading the word of God and continue in sin. One reason uh, I've seen people... Uh, tell me, you know, well, the reason I don't do so-and-so is because, or I do this because, and then I look at their Bible and it looked like they just took it out of the case they bought it in, you know. Uh, still got uh, unruffled pages and all that. You don't spend time in the Bible. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Recognize the power of God's Word to overcome covetousness. And then number four, recognize that contentment with whatever God provides, God's provision, helps prevent covetousness. Hebrews 13, 5 is a good verse for this. Here's what it says. Let your conversation, not just your talk, but the whole way you live. Let your conversation, we would say today, lifestyle. Let your lifestyle be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have for he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. You see, the old nature is still linked to the world. It's still linked to death. That's why we have to deal with it every day. The flesh is still obsessed with everything that the world offers. The old man, according to the Bible, the old man died with Jesus on the cross potentially. That's the key word, potentially. So what does that mean? That means that it's up to each one of us to put him on the cross every day by our choice. Kill him. Paul said, I die daily. Now, let me give you number three in the main outline here. Now, some of you I know keep good outlines. And number one was put God first if you're budgeting your money. Number two was put self on the cross. And number three, put a plan in place. A lot of people think that whenever they make money and they sign their check and the money goes in the account, it's all going to work out. I can tell you that it doesn't. <laughs> I mean, you need to know every penny you spend. You need to know exactly where it went. I sit down and when a credit card statement comes in, I want money on hand to pay that credit card off. So what I do is I go down there and I analyze each one of them, make sure I recognize every expenditure, put a plan in place. In other words, what the plan does is it helps you match your income to your necessities. The plan helps you match your income to your necessities, not to your wants. Your wants may come along after a while, but the necessities are the main things you're focusing on. And that means you want to avoid debt. I remember at Tennessee Temple, uh, Dr. J.R. Faulkner used to, just every time you heard him speak or every time he met with a group of us, 
he would always say this, young people, plan your work and work your plan. Plan your work and work your plan. And I'd say, you know, that works in your budget too. Plan your budget and work that plan. It applies to your budget. You're not going to control your spending until you decide to control your spending. Your budget doesn't have to be elaborate, but it does have to be specific. It doesn't have to be elaborate, but it does have to be specific. In our family, everybody in our family operates on a budget. Now, we don't have this long piece of paper, you know, that you unroll it like you would a roll of toilet paper with every little item listed on there. But we do have specifics um, in our, in our uh, budget that we follow. For example, the first thing, and Gene and I, before we got married, we decided on this, tithe and give an offering on our gross income. That's before the government gets a hold of it or anybody else gets a hold of it. We give that money to the Lord right off the top because then we're not God robbers. I mean, let's face it, if you don't tithe, you're a God robber. That's what God says. <laughs> That's not my opinion. That's what God said. Um, secondly, save for most purchases and pay as you go. The first is tithe and give an offering on all income. The second is save for most purchases and pay as you go. That's a good rule to follow. Now, I understand that you do too. There are going to be times in your life when unexpected things come up and you don't have the money to pay as you go. And you're going to have to maybe use some credit. Credit should be something that we do use in an emergency, not necessarily something we use for convenience. The world sells it to us as convenience. And there may be something to be said for, you know, making it easier to control your income by credit card and then putting the money down, but never, never buy more than you can pay for. Avoid debt as much as possible. Um, save for most purchases and pay as you go. Number three, avoid debt as much as possible. And then number four, limit weekly spending allowances. I was talking to a family about their budget one time, and I said, so what's your weekly spending allowance? And the guy said, we don't have one. And I said, why? And he said, well, if we want something, we just go get it. And I said, that's dangerous, <laughs> extremely dangerous. Um, limit weekly spending allowances. Um, in other words, set aside a certain amount of money that you expect yourself to get by on for that week and try to stick to that. And then number five, put some money regularly into a contingency fund. I suggest, uh, since you have to have it quickly, there's no, you don't get much return on a savings account today, but you really need to have somewhere where you can put aside some money so if an unexpected event occurs, and you have to have the money to cover it, like the washing machine breaks or the car's got to have new brakes on it or something like that. Put some money regularly into a contingency fund. And then number six is save and invest regularly. Uh, <clears throat> one of my friends spent $100 a week on scratch-offs and lottery. He made quite a bit of money, had a good job, made about 1000 a week when I was making 150 a week. Uh, he would spend about a hundred dollars a week, sometimes more, on scratch offs and lottery. Then one day he told me he said, uh, "Well, I want twenty-five hundred dollars on on uh, a scratch off or a lottery, something like that." And I said, "Oh, really?" So he'd been putting in a hundred dollars a week for twenty years, and so he won twenty-five hundred dollars. You figure the math: hundred dollars a week—that's fifty-two hundred a year, right? <laughs> and he won twenty-five hundred dollars. Uh, any businessman will tell you that's not a good investment, right? So um, interestingly, he ran into a situation. He lost uh, his job, and I had talked about how much our family tries to help, you know, missionaries and people like that. So he told me this one day when he lost his job and we were working together at EMS. He said, if you want to help somebody, you can help me. I don't have any income at all. And I said, well, you're putting $100 a week into scratch-offs. I was putting 200 a month into an investment account. And I said, it's not my responsibility to pay for your life. It's your responsibility, okay? I said, I'm responsible for my wife, my children, my grandchildren. I'm not responsible for everybody else. I said, if I have money to help somebody, I never lend it, I give it. I got burned so many times lending, I quit doing that. So if I got money and I want to help, I give it. So here uh, in our family, we operate first tithe and give an offering on all income. Second, save for most purchases and pay as you go. 
Third, avoid debt as much as possible. Fourth, limit weekly spending allowances. Fifth, put some money regularly into a contingency fund. And six, save and invest regularly. And if you need some outside help, uh, buy a book by Dave Ramsey, who is not only a Christian, but he's internationally famous as an advisor on management and investment. One thing we never do in, um, is spend money just to say we spent money. You probably don't want to do that either. You see, there's no effort to use money uh, in our family to impress anyone. In fact, almost all of our clothes come from bargain shops. Uh, what I'm wearing today, the trousers, the tie, the jacket, and the shirt. Probably the total cost in all of them is under $10. You know, why? Because we don't, you know, we don't care whether anybody knows we save money. And um, we, we shop in bargain shops, secondhand shops, consignment shops. And we have a weekly spending allotment that we comply with. That usually is used for buying coffee um, and eating out. Fun stuff. You should. Somebody said years ago, if you have a dollar, spend 50 cents on roses. Um, there should always be some time that you have set aside for something that you'd like to do. Um, in our family, we seldom use a credit card unless the money is in hand to pay it off when the bill arrives. Have there been times when an emergency came up and we had to put something on there and couldn't pay it off? Sure. But because we were frugal all the time, eventually we got it paid off. You know, So uh, the key is stay out of debt and uh, as much as possible. One of my preacher friends told me one time, uh, he said, um, pastor of one of the largest black churches in Orlando, Florida, and uh, he was saying, uh, Brother Goodell, he said, if they would send me to Washington, I can solve this financial problem that the, uh, the country has. And I said, how would you do that, Glendy? He said, I'd tell them what my great-great-grandpappy said, what my great-grandpappy said, what my grandpappy said, and what my pappy said. And I said, what was that? He said, when your outgo exceeds your income, your upkeep is going to be your downfall. <laughs> In short, don't spend more money than you have. That's basically what he's saying. And our government needs to learn that lesson. Well, in over 60 years of counseling, I have seen poor money management as the main cause in the collapse of families. As a matter of fact, at one time, I don't know if it's still true, at one time the American Psychological Association was saying that uh, money management uh, or lack of money management is the main cause of divorce in America. Well, the key to managing your income at any level is your ability to say no to the old man. Just say no. Um, over the years that Gene and I have been married, one of the things that I've learned is that money problems are not related to how much you earn. They are related to how you manage what you earn. Earn. So if you have a plan for your finances, you got to stick to the plan. One of the main causes of collapsing uh, financial situation in homes is failure to stick with the plan. I've noticed that most financial problems are related to the point at which the plan is abandoned. Some people have the plan. Now let me share some closing thoughts for you on managing your money. First, learn to be content regardless of your income. Learn to be content regardless of your income. Philippians 4.11, Paul said, I've learned in whatsoever state I am, there was to be content. He goes on to say, I learned how to have a lot, and he said, I learned how to have almost nothing, and I said, I've been content in both places. He wrote that now from death row. So learn to be content regardless of your income, Philippians 4.11, just adjust your life to it. Secondly, learn to enjoy the presence of the Lord more than you enjoy things. <laughs> Hebrews 13, 5. Be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have, for he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So is the presence of the Lord and the fellowship with the Lord more important to you than things? If it is, you'll be content with whatever you have. So first, learn to be content regardless of your income. Secondly, learn to enjoy the presence of the Lord more than you enjoy things. And then thirdly, learn to appreciate the basics in life. Most people are so unthankful. 
we got up on the wall over here the words be thankful said he put up for us there and we're coming up on thanksgiving and i try to thank the lord every day i, I don't think a day passes that i don't thank the lord for a lot of things and um, the basics in life paul wrote to timothy and he said in first timothy 6 8 and having food and raiment let us be there with content so as long as there is Aldi and consignment shops, we're okay. Right? <laughs> and, we, and we're all set. Learn to appreciate the basics in life. I thank the Lord every day, you know. We have food to eat. We have a place to live. We have clothes to wear. <coughs> then number four, learn that right living is directly related to contentment. The reason a lot of people are discontent uh, is not because they don't have anything. It's because their attitude toward it situation. Learn that right living is directly related to contentment. First Timothy 6.6, 6, Paul says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness. So the closer people are to the Lord, the more righteously they are living, uh, the less likely they're going to uh, be discontent, regardless of how little they have. I've traveled in third world countries. I call them fourth world countries. They're in bad shape. I've gone into to huts in Haiti where people were living in a shipping crate. And the spirit of joy in that shipping crate house was amazing to me. I've been in the backwoods of uh, the Ukraine, Belarus, uh, Russia, places like that. And I've seen people living in places that most of us would be embarrassed to live in. But the spirit and attitude was dramatically positive in their love for the Lord. Well, Charles Harold Tinley was born to his black parents in slavery July the 7th, 1851. Largely, he was self-taught because uh, blacks were not encouraged to get educated. He worked at many jobs in order to survive, and finally, after he became a Christian, God called him to preach. And you probably did not know that someone like that wrote this song. If the world from you withhold of its silver and its gold, and you have to get along with meager fare, just remember in his word how he feeds the little bird. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. If your body suffers pain and your health you can't regain, and your soul is almost sinking in despair, Jesus knows the pain you feel. He can save and he can heal. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. When your enemies assail and your heart begins to fail, don't forget that God in heaven answers prayer. He will make a way for you and will lead you safely through. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. When your youthful days are gone and old age is stealing on and your body bends beneath the weight of care, He will never leave you then he'll go with you to the end take your burden to the Lord and leave it there the chorus says leave it there leave it there take your burden to the Lord and leave it there if you trust and never doubt he will surely bring you out take your burden to the Lord and leave it there so let me close with this statement. If your relationship with the Lord is what it's supposed to be, your budget won't be a problem. Let's stand for prayer. Father, thank you for guiding us in this life. We deserve nothing and you've given us everything. We complain about a lot of things and very seldom do we thank you for all the benefits that you showered upon our lives. And Lord, I pray that you speak to our hearts during this invitation. If anyone needs to respond, I pray that person will step out as soon as the first note is sung. Help us to realize, Lord, that the resources that we're allowed to have are supposed to be managed in accordance with a way that honors you. Help us to follow that principle, to practice it in every aspect of our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. What page? And remember as we leave today that your budget is going to be pretty much based upon your spiritual condition.
You can budget without being a Christian, but if you're a Christian, you ought to be able to budget. You ought to have the right attitude toward resources. Lord, lay some soul upon my heart, and then Paul will lead us in prayer. Thank you.